Hello, everybody, and very welcome to today's event, Good for Financial Services, Good for the UK Economy, Restoring UK Law. As you know, we are out of the European Union and it, the UK is poised to make its own laws across many sectors of the economy. Today, we're going to focus on financial services. With us, and we're very delighted to welcome a, a very distinguished panel, we have the Right Honourable Suella Braverman, who's the Attorney General for England and Wales and Advocate General for Northern Ireland. Barnabas Reynolds, who's a partner and head of financial institutions at Sherman and Sterling. Barney has written to a new, brand new publication for Politair and out today, Restoring UK Law, Freeing the UK's Financial Global Market. We're joined beside me by uh, Baroness Deitch. Uh, Ruth is a lawyer by background was a member of the Oxford Law Faculty and head of principal of St Anne's College, Oxford. She is now a non-executive board member of the Law Commission. And thank you very much also to Lord Thomas, who has joined us today. Lord Thomas was the former Chief Justice for England and Wales, but today is Chairman of the Financial Markets Law Committee. And speaking last will be the Right Honourable Sir Ian Duncan Smith. It's a very great pleasure to welcome Ian Patik and congratulate him on his new role as chairman of the UK's Task Force for Innovation, Growth and Regulatory Reform. Ian was former Secretary of State for Pensions and also leader of the Conservative Party. So without any delay, may I call on Suella Braverman to open the proceedings. Suella. Thank you, Sheila. Um, and I want to just pay tribute to Politea and the team for making a significant contribution to debates for uh, a very, very many years now, um, and not least on the uh, issue of Brexit. And I know that your organisation will continue to play a critical role as we go forward in using our imagination, our creativity, and drawing on the best expertise to try and make the most of the opportunities that lie ahead. So thank you very much for hosting. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna say a few well, words. We have also with us today, our brand new director, Edita Lidgeri, who's a barrister, and she'll say a few words later on. Very good to, to welcome Edith. So last week, I spoke to a group of law students at the University of Chichester. And it's always refreshing to speak to people at the very beginning of their legal careers when anything is possible, limited only by their own ambition. And it got me reflecting on the law as a profession. We are, I think, very lucky to have so many options open to us. We can be practitioners, academics, policy advisors, judges, and a few, uh, a few of us manage to be several at once. And I think Barney Reynolds is one such individual. At least that's my view having read his book. It's written with the practical insights that can only come from helping clients navigate these rules on a daily basis. It has the intellectual depth and rigor of an academic treatise. And in a manner worthy of any policy advisor, it gives clear workable solutions to the issue raised, what's to be done with the law on financial services now that we've left the EU. Of course, there are a great many ways to answer that question, but it's probably useful to begin with something broad. I'm interested in what principles should guide the UK's policy here. I'm not going to answer the question in a technical way or with great high-minded theories. I will leave that to the experts. This is an answer that can really only be told through experience. As the American judge Oliver Wendell Holmes said, the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. So I begin with the experience of a young Scot by the name of William Murray, who came south for his higher studies, becoming a lawyer. He studied at Westminster School. Incidentally, my office window looks out onto its courtyard and later Oxford. But there, the only law uh, taught was Roman. And Murray effectively taught himself law as a young barrister, borrowing books and notes from colleagues sitting in court. What he discovered troubled him. The common law was in a bad way. It was fit for the time of the Plantagenets, perhaps, with land being the only property worth worrying about. 
But for a nation on the cusp of the industrial revolution, the common law courts were so out of touch that businessmen settled most of their cases by private arbitration. So I'll skip a few steps, including, particularly interesting for me, Murray's brief service as Attorney General, with, men, with the young Murray, now middle-aged, becoming the Chief Justice of the Court of King's Bench in 1755. He took the title Lord Mansfield, a name familiar with many of you, I'm sure. Lord Mansfield set about bringing these commercial usages and customs into the fold of the common law. They were not homegrown rules, or at least not entirely. They were a collection of habits which had been hammered out over time by arbitrators in the markets and docks throughout Europe, free from state interference. They were sometimes known as the law merchant or Lex Mercatoria and existed throughout Europe, especially coastal ports with some local variations. These vari variations would be known and understood in practice. The way we do business in this part of the Baltic, for example, is a little bit different from Rotterdam and again, different in Dover. How did Mansfield do it? Well, you could say there were push and pull factors. On the one hand, merchants were increasingly pushed into the courts with increased commercial complexity, legal disputes and transactions becoming more valuable and consequential with greater risk of relying on voluntary arbitration. The pull factor was built over time. Courts under Mansfield's direction became attractive to businesses. He was known for his pragmatism, care in understanding commercial practice and over time, predictability and certainty in deciding cases. For example, he was known to set up commercial juries to bring experts from merchant communities to advise him in court of commercial practices and to explain complexities. Through this method, Mansfield matched the law to fit society, not the other way round. Now, I'm not saying we should suddenly get the CEO of Barclay sitting behind the judges in the next banking case. We have other ways of getting that evidence in. And while we're on the topic, and I digress slightly, of juries to jump to the common garden variety of criminal juries, because they've been in the legal press, I'd like to make it very clear that both the Lord Chancellor and I will always support the full jury as a vital element of the rule of law. Any attempts to reduce the numbers or otherwise tamper with that ancient tradition is totally unacceptable. It should only be a very, very last resort. Juries are a key feature of our common law system, a uniquely important legacy of community-led justice. So to get back to commercial justice, Mansfield's project worked. The rules he incorporated case by case gradually knitted together into what is a recognizably modern English commercial law. In a way, his advancement of legal thought was paired in economic thought by Adam Smith, a contemporary. Why on earth did the law merchant, which had always been separate from the common law, fit in so well? The reason is, the law merchant evolved in a very similar manner and had the same priorities. More importantly, it was never frozen. By its very nature, it changed at the pace set by the commercial world. It developed incrementally over time, matching commercial expectations with a focus on predictable outcomes. It emphasized personal responsibility, freedom of contract, the importance of property rights. Its rules were pragmatic rather than technical, except where they needed to be. Seen in this light, it's quite easy to see why the influx of European law after 1972 never quite flourished in our common law soil in the way that the law merchant did. By and large, EU law is developed in a structural technocratic way, seeking to capture all laws in one great code, which is then frozen in its terms and interpreted increasingly creatively and purposively by judges anxious to improve its failings or respond to new socio-political objectives. This is not the kind of law Mansfield brought into the law reports and is generally not the best law to do business by. So what principles should be our guiding light from here on in? My answer to that question is this. In restoring UK law, we should remember the pragmatism that shaped it. The great Lord Mansfield, the lawyers in his courts and the commercial clients that stood behind them, built a system that was based on experience and the needs of commerce. It was predictable that it needed to be when it needed to be, but was nonetheless capable of change when novel situations or financial instruments were developed. In short, it was a collection of real life disputes, each decided on their facts, cross-referenced uh, by, by each other and built up into a body of predictable precedents. 
that law worked itself pure over the next half century and a half. And some of it ended up being codified, many of which are the basis of our current legislation. Whereas now we have the reverse problem. We have legislation on the books that was not necessarily worked pure over thousands of cases in our own courts. We have legislation that is the output from a very different and much less responsive legislative machine. Now we must decide what to do with it. So like those students in Chichester, indeed like Mansfield himself when he came to London, we're at the beginning of a new chapter. The prime minister has described ourselves as being at the beginning of the new chapter. There's no limit but our own ambition. And I know that this seminal work by Barney Reynolds will make a massive contribution to how the UK writes its next chapter in our legal history. Thank you very much, Suella. Thank you. Barney, would you like to tell us uh, something about the next chapter? Thank you, Sheila, and thank you uh, very much, Suella, for your kind words. Um, there are two main legal systems prevalent around the world. The common law system, which operates here and in other English speaking countries, and the codified civil law system, largely based on French and German models. The most successful financial centers in the world, London, New York, Singapore, and Hong Kong, operate under the common law systems. New financial centers being established in the Middle East and elsewhere are choosing to adopt the common law as well. And research mm. has shown that the stark superiority, um, of, uh, that there is a stark superiority uh, of the common law for economic growth. There are subtle and complex differences between the common law and continental code-based legal systems. The methods of thought of both systems are reflected in and reflect the societies within which they operate. The common law values, uh, values individual and business liberty. It's judge-based with famous lawyers, starting with Lord Mansfield, uh, Suella just mentioned, a Scotsman of the 18th century, having played key roles in developing a system respectful of commercial affairs. But it's also successful because the common law has no single omniscient creator, which leaves it to focus on appropriate remedies and liabilities and limited restrictions where those are necessary. The civil law systems of the continent, notably in co contrast to Scots civil law, which is like the common law in this context, are based on Franco-German code-based models developed in the 19th century and seek to provide answers in advance for every problem or any problem. The code is likely to set out rights as well as restrictions, putting them in tension with one another. The scheme is designed for control. So the principal drafter of the French civil code said in 1801 that this code was an expression of an overriding desire to sacrifice all rights to political ends and no longer consider anything but the mysterious and variable interests of the state. EU law has developed largely on the continental model. For financial services, it has unfurled a voluminous code developed since 1989 across the entire se sector. The law becomes ossified, requiring constant attempts to update and upgrade the code and its operating system. The method has become seriously at odds with the approach in the UK. Further, its use of a purposive method of interpretation, which is far from the method of interpreting statutes employed in the UK, gives officials the power to assert purposes and hence in the commercial context to control businesses. Now we've left the EU, the UK should reclaim the benefits of its traditional approach. This means removing the undesirable elements of EU law and rewriting the provisions that remain along common law lines. It will involve the significant task of reformulating the inherited EU a key under parliamentary oversight. For financial services, most of the rules can be moved out of the statute books and given to our sophisticated regulators to address under the supervision of Parliament's Treasury Select Committee. The regulators already have wide ranging powers to make rules and they will be able to redo inherited EU laws along UK lines far more quickly than could ever be achieved through parliamentary processes. The Treasury Select Committee should establish a subcommittee which can draw on a panel of experts, including legal experts, to oversee the process. Reviving the common law approach also means encouraging and adopting more case law. This means addressing the reasons why many financial firms do not bring cases in the courts against the regulators. One idea would be to restrict the reporting of cases until liability has been determined, particularly when the allegations being made are akin to those involving the criminal law 
in that they could result in significant reputational harm. In addition, we should address the current tendency for law to be done on the cheap. For instance, the financial ombudsman has the ability to ignore the law and merely seek to achieve fairness with all the detrimental effects which that brings for society and business. At the very least, there needs to be a judicial oversight of the ombudsman, but more ambitiously, we should use junior judges for small financial claims, creating more case law precedent and replacing the role of the ombudsman entirely or in part. These are the core steps, but on their own, they won't be enough in the financial services context, since here there's an additional aspect of the legal system, financial regulation. In financial services, our regulators now operate a system which mixes the continental model with our own. The EU's single financial services rulebook has been written in such detail, with one measure, MIFID II, containing 1.7 million provisions, that for many areas, our regulators have been reduced to arbiters of fact as to whether a particular poorly drafted rule has been breached. Then, in order to avoid making even more rules, they've adopted vague regulator principles designed to fill in the gaps by applying generalized values. However, this approach leads to double uncertainty. Once through the application of the EU's purposive approach to the interpretation of the rules, and secondly, through the vague regulator principles. After the financial crisis, there has been increased regulatory challenge of firms by the regulators, but this has not been accompanied by an equivalent challenge by the firms of the regulators themselves. The situation will only get worse as the UK's regulators are given greater scope to make the rules as is now envisaged. Our regulators are of high quality and act in a way that can be seen as justifiable, particularly in retrospect. But that's not the point. The brilliance of the common law is that in its framework for the market, it provides for flexibility, yet also predictability and certainty. This leaves market participants free to innovate with confidence in what they are allowed to do. The common law allows the private sector as much of an ability to use its predictive effect as it does the state or the regulators. In order to reclaim our system in the regulatory context, we need to introduce greater checks and balances in two main ways. First, we must enhance parliamentary scrutiny of the regulators. The Treasury Select Committee, which oversees the regulators, could appoint a permanent subcommittee for this purpose, which would again draw on a panel of experts, including legal experts, to oversee the regulatory rulemaking and supervision. Secondly, greater statutory definition of regulators' powers and objectives will, would allow for an enhanced use of judicial review. If we take these steps and some others, the UK will rediscover the full benefits of liberty and wealth produced by our common law and Scots law heritage. The internet age only increases those benefits by allowing customers worldwide to seek out the best services and products wherever they're located. The opportunities for the UK and its global financial market are huge. However, the opportunities ahead for the UK require us to understand the workings and benefits of the system we operate, and more importantly, uh, the benefits that our system can bring if it's now reinvigorated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barney, and congratulations on an excellent study. And I can share with the whole audience that you're one of the hardest workers I've ever come across. And you certainly uh, have been working on this since, since the summer, if not, and thinking about it even longer. So well done. I'm glad to Thank see you. that. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to invite Baroness Deitch to, to, to speak. Please, Ruth. Congratulations to Barney on his dedicated mission to reform this area and his perspicacity in seeing what was wrong. It's regrettable but unsurprising that the EU has not seen the problems and taken his advice. I differ from his analysis in only one respect relating to the behaviour of regulators, which I will come to. I'm going to speak only about what I know about, my experience as having been regulated and regulating, where in my role as chair of the Bar Standards Board and independent adjudicator for higher education, I often felt more regulated against than regulating. And let me start with a very well-known but apt quote, Lord Denning. The Treaty of Rome is like an incoming tide. It flows into the estuaries and up the rivers. It cannot be held back. Lord Goff mischievously wondered whether his former colleague had forgotten that tides go out as well as come in. I'd like to address the issue of the Court of Justice of the European Union and the possibilities of innovation that will now be more open to us. 
the court exemplifies the sort of depressing hidebound legal system described in Barney's book. And it is, of course, at the peak of it. Its very composition militates against the sort of independence of the judiciary that we expect in this country and which is intrinsic to the rule of law. The European judges are nominated by their governments for a term of six years renewable. Given the salaries and the prestige, what judge would not want to be renominated? Renewal possibilities cannot but cast a shadow over the perception of impartiality of any judge and the UK would not find such a system acceptable for the High Court or the Supreme Court judges. And the salaries. Currently, at least 275,000 euros for a European judge and the allowances, entertainment, household, child, education, residence, installation, resettlement, traveling, removal, insurance, transitional, pension for life payable at 65, subsistence, sickness, occupational disease, industrial accident and birth and death benefits and for a death in service. But most of those judges do not have the domestic judicial experience that we would expect of nominees to our superior courts, but they are law professors, civil servants, ministers, ambassadors, or a combination of those experience. I thought of this salary munificence when the European Court in 2018 upheld the decision of the European Parliament that MEPs do not have to provide details of their costs or their monthly expense allowance. The appointment, perceived independence and behaviour of the justices of the Court of Justice of the European Union are at the very least open to serious question. They would not be tolerated at common law. And of course, they have just sacked one of their own judges, Eleanor Sharpson, dismissed at two days notice, and we should be shouting from the rooftops about this incredible situation of a court sacking one of its own judges. This is the court before which the UK lost cases, for example, on the bonus cap. It is a court that has disrespected subsidiarity, respect for national identities and essential state functions as curbs on its own power. In the HS2 case, Lords Neuberger and Mance referred to the problems caused by the unpredictability of the interpretative approach of the European court. And many is the academic article complaining about its purposive and self-aggrandizing approach. EU law stifles innovation. The entire EU is hostile to innovation. By the way, one need look no further than the infamous contract between the EU and AstraZeneca drafted according to Belgian law to see imprecise obligations of the sort that a good common lawyer would not have allowed. The EU has placed a string of obstacles in the way of digital startups, leaving the EU in the slow lane of the digital revolution. There's never been, and there never will be, a European Google, Facebook or Amazon, unlike China. It installed an extreme version of the precautionary principle in the Lisbon Treaty itself. Both the Commission and the Parliament have determinedly opposed or hobbled mobile data, fracking and genetic modification. The UK would never have got on and got ahead with stem cell research and advances in reproductive science had it signed up to the Oviedo Treaty or the Charter of Fundamental Rights fully. EU regulation hampered change by introducing legal uncertainty, inconsistency with other regulations, prescriptive rules and high compliance costs. The EU Medical Devices Directive resulted in significantly fewer and more expensive new medical devices than would otherwise have come forward. Um, not one of the EU's most valuable companies has been formed in the last 40 years. The General Data Protection Regulation has apparently hurt small firms unable to meet the cost of compliance and it favours the big technology companies. It is a significant burden and I hope we can change it. Now, we can change this law. We do have the mechanisms starting already. I gather that the Prime Minister is convening a Build Back Better Council and the Chancellor is chairing a new Better Regulation Committee to investigate EU-derived regulation and reform it 
though it may be that in substance there's not much we would actually want to get rid of. Now this is where I raise some questions about the Reynolds formula. I don't believe that we can bank on using courts more and ombudsman and alternative dispute resolution less. The courts are currently overcrowded, slow and expensive, even more so now. I don't think I agree with favoring more precedents and tighter drafted rules to be applied by regulators. And surely their, spe their speeches should not be setting precedents. If the regulators are too rigid, they will be judicially reviewed by those subject to them because the principle of judicial review is that individual cases or exceptions should be considered. And rigidity is what EU law is criticized for. Judicial review is itself riddled with EU law. It imposes principles that regulators or those who are regulated do not necessarily know about. It is right that it is being reviewed by Lord Fawkes. I also found that the outcomes focused model of regulatory rules was pretty useless, certainly in the legal regulation world. One needs to know the rules, not that any means are all right if the end justifies the means. And finally, the choice of regulators is all important. There are far too many quango queens and kings with no professional background in what they are regulating who get the jobs by speaking the regulatory jargon. My final thought is that we must never again enter into a treaty that fetters our sovereign rulemaking ability. Even with the climate change treaty, one should be wary of intrusion into the sovereign field. And let me finish with another quote from Lord Gough. Continental lawyers, he said, love to proclaim some great principle and then knock it into shape afterwards. Instead, the boring British want to find out first whether, and if so, how these great ideas are going to work in practice. And that is what we are going to do. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ruth. Thank you very much. And uh, Lord Thomas, please. In looking at the position we currently face, I think there are two principal questions. The first, what should we do to ensure that in devising the broad scope of regulation <laughs> we should have, what is best to maintain London's leading global and European position? That is not a matter on which I am qualified to speak. But the second, and I think e equally important, is how do we best use our skills uh, to craft a legal and regulatory regime that will underpin whatever new legislative principles we agree on. And it's the second I want to say something about. Now, but first, can I just pay a, sh a short tribute to Barney's uh, great study? Uh, he sets out in considerable detail, and therefore it is not necessary to repeat, the very significant criticisms that can be made of a centralized based code system. That kind of system has generally been alien to our tradition and has not been helpful in fostering innovation. Now, secondly, and this I think is a very central point, he points to the need for a proper understanding of the different roles that the three institutions of government play, <clears throat> the, uh, the executive, parliament and the courts. And I think it's of particular importance that Parliament has a central role if we move to a regulatory regime where regulators make the rules. And I think that they are, will be far better at doing that than attempting to do it through a centralized civil service. But it does require Parliament to do two things. Uh, first of all, to scrutinize the rules and make certain they're not too long and are written in good, proper, <clears throat> rulemaking language. And secondly, that they hold the regulators to account. Now, it's obvious that when you draft rules, you won't foresee everything, but there may be some things you ought to have foreseen or other things you ought to explain why you didn't foresee them. And so I regard the way in which we move forward, if we are to give, as appears to be the case, much more power to regulators, Parliament plays a central role. But that, I think, also facilitates the role of the courts, because as uh, Barney very forcefully argues, there will be considerable discretionary powers that are given to the regulators, and those must uh, properly be looked at. And it is at those powers
matters uh, that the <coughs> judges and the courts are best placed to deal with, or a tribunal or others. Because the great virtue of our system of law is that it's good at doing that, providing it doesn't try and overreach ourselves. So what I'd like to do is look at what I think are six huge advantages that our legal system gives us and which we should deploy. We've obviously got to have a debate on whether, as Ruthie has said, we, we have a system that's outcomes-based, a sensible principles-based, or, or a principle that relies over, on over-prescription of rules, such as what led to the Enron disaster. But let me look at those six points, uh, which I don't think are really so much in need of debate, but in point of stressing. First, as Sarah Bremen has, has so eloquently said earlier, we have an enormous tradition, beginning uh, in truth with Lord Mansfield, but continuing right through of judges going to try and make certain they can understand the law and the way it uh, reacts with commerce, because you can't develop the law in areas of technical expertise, such as trade, commerce, and finance, uh, without a, a good understanding of the law. To explain very eloquently how Lord Mansfield did this through the jury, today we're slightly more up to date, and one of the roles the Financial Markets Law Committee plays, it plays is actually making certain that in a world where things change very, very rapidly, the judges are fully up to date with what is happening. Secondly, that enables the judges to develop the law where it's when <coughs> digital, the economy changes, fintech comes along. And it also has a procedural system that is very fast. I think most countries in the world would be astounded that we sorted out the extremely difficult issues on business interruption and insurance by the use of recent procedural innovations that enabled it to be determined by the High Court, uh, by the High Court and then the Supreme Court within a matter of months. Thirdly, our law is very good at providing certainty. It's a precedent-based system with an open process. And I think, I, here I don't entirely agree with Ruth Deitch, it, it, it's much better to do it that way than behind the closed doors of, of the Ombudsman uh, or, or mediation services. But we've got to make our system cheap. Fourthly, I think it's very important that our, our system is seen to have one of its principal values, which is looking to the spirit of what is in the regulations and not the technical uh, <coughs> outcome that can sometimes be argued for. That was the great mistake that happened in Enron. And uh, I think there the courts have generally been successful. Fifthly, it seems to me that we, Although we do, I think, rightly criticize the continental system, as Lord Mansfield is a great example, we do borrow well. We're quite good at looking at other people's systems, saying that little bit does quite well, let's have that, but fit it into our mindset of, of innovation and enterprise. We're well suited to weaving the best out of other systems into our own. And finally, and I think this is the point I would like to stress the most, we must regain our leadership. Our, our system is greatly admired across the world because it gets there quickly and generally gets there right. Judges in the early part of the 20th century used to go uh, to represent uh, our interests at international conferences where it was necessary to codify some of the law. And that is another example mm. of leadership. But that's what we must do. We must punch above our weight. We must show that our system is the best and use it to underpin what I hope will be a flexible uh, but properly scrutinized system of regulation. We must use the law's advantages to the full. Thank you very much, Lord Thomas. And Ian Duncan Smith, please. Uh, Sheila, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure to uh, appear on this panel, um, uh, following uh, some way down from my very good friend Suella, uh, who I was over the moon when she was appointed to her present job, uh, and Barney as well, and then to listen to two of the finest minds on law that I could possibly wish to sit and listen to. 
such as Baroness Deitch and Lord Thomas, I must say, fascinating. I could spend ages just listening uh, to that debate. I think it's really, really uh, excellent. I, I apologize for being the only person here who is not a lawyer. The only time I've ever done that in my life, uh, but at least I'm not charging. So the point is uh, that I, I want to thank uh, Sheila. You have run a very good think tank here. And I must say that uh, it's produced some fantastic publications. Your stuff is always in depth. Um, I set up the Center for Social Justice. We do a lot of publications ourselves, and I have spent a lot of time looking at this. And I must say, you are right up at the top there with your uh, your 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 care on how this is done. And a thanks to Barney as well, because I've worked closely with Barney for some time now, and uh, very much from the start of his enhanced equivalence paper, which I still think is the key to how the the, the financial services sector should cooperate with the EU, if only the EU would listen, uh, which they're not all that good at doing at the best of times. Uh, but anyway, I think it would certainly be the way ahead. So uh, thanks to Barney for this paper, which I've read, I have to say, it's very complex, but fascinating, and it has given me some thinking. And I therefore would also say that um, uh, the commission that I've been asked to do, uh, to run or to chair, is a very short-term commission. It's only going to last uh, until early May. The purpose, as the Prime Minister asked me to do, is to look at uh, the nature of regulation post um, uh, our departure from the EU and to uh, come forward with uh, things that we think we can do, which are early uh, indicative applications of reduction in <coughs> onerous regulation, uh, and, uh, but a wide uh, flexibility on my part to how that should be done. I, I have therefore looked at this and very much agreed with much of what Baroness Deitch did. She took me back in a way to my time fighting the Maastricht Treaty back in 1992. I remember I used to arm myself with a book called Lassock and Bridge, which was, uh, as many lawyers will know, the, uh, the key to understanding European law. Um, and it was through reading that uh, uh, carefully that I realized exactly what was going on was that the, 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 the Court of Justice is a massively interpretive organization and it has at its core constantly ever closer union. It must always find on the basis in doubt of ever closer union. And that means straight away that they are already uh, judgmental in the sense prior to the case. Uh, so uh, this was clearly the ratchet. So from that, now we are free from that ratchet process. The question is, what can we do? And this is where I think Barney's paper is very, very important. I, I've decided on reading it uh, very much that I'm going to go a little wider than the Prime Minister originally asked me. <laughs> I think it's necessary because <clears throat> I don't think um, I'm very keen on just coming forward with single uh, things that we can do. I really want to set this in the context of what we should do going forward and then how we can both deregulate and regulate. It's an important feature of this. And so one of the, the, the things that I take from the, is exactly that change, which uh, both all of the, those who've been speaking today have, uh, have talked about, which is the rebalancing from what is essentially a, the coded process of, uh, of European law uh, to the common law um, uh, precedent-based uh, uh, process, which I think is infinitely more flexible and it is interesting, as, as Barney said, that so many of the new financial centers opening up around the world have chosen to go for English. I say this uh, very uh, stressfully, English common law, a little bit more than uh, the American version of it, but certainly the English interpretation of it. And I think that's an important feature because people are choosing that because of its flexibility uh, that pays dividends when it comes to business relationships and judgments in those areas and much simpler contracts. And so all of that, recognizing that the UK is re-emerging back in this, can play a leadership role and think all of this. So what I've said that we will do um, when we, we work on this with my two colleagues, plus all the support we've had, we've broken uh, our review into <clears throat> really four main areas. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, obviously, the financial services and across the board at the, the services sector, you know, financial services, SME finance, fintech, that sort of thing. We're then also going to be looking at what I would call more advanced manufacturing uh, to see where the regulations have impacted on that. We're also looking at biosciences, such as gene edited foods and blood resistant crops, those sort of things, uh, areas that we have sh been shut out of uh, uh, for some time because of judgments made in the EU. And finally, uh, this is the area that I'm 
question is the growth industries, things like artificial intelligence, you know, which will apply to autonomous vehicles, uh, clinical trials, health data, regenerative medicine, biometrics, those sort of things. And what I'm uh, the reason why I mention this is because uh, what I think we have to do is we have to both set out if we are returning to a more flexible process of regulation. Uh, and then derive deregulation from that, which we will exemplify through key areas in this. Well, not, it's not going to be an exhaustive list by any means, but we'll try and exemplify what we say about this uh, new base, as it were, of regulation. But we also need to look ahead, and that's where the, uh, the new areas like AI, how will we regulate when it comes to these areas? What principles will we apply to them? How flexible can we be? Uh, my instinct is that when we return to this base, this process that has been spoken of on so eloquently by uh, all on the panel before me, um, it, I think it gives the UK a real opportunity, which I think has been underestimated, uh, to compete massively uh, with what has been going on in the States. I, for one, I don't know about everybody else, rather tired of being regulated by California. I think it's high time we, uh, the UK, was able to take back that process of leading in these areas uh, because we are uh, as flexible, but uh, often more reason-based uh, than sometimes they are there. And I think it's high time we were able to compete on these areas. And I think the base of where we look ahead to the idea of how we regulate in the future, smart regulation, light touch regulation, uh, on the basis of common laws, a sense that you regulate for the things that are necessary to be regulated, but you leave people to make their choices and companies to do things that are not illegal until you deem them to be illegal or wrong, rather than the other way around, which I think is the coded process, which sets out all your responsibilities. So in that sense, we're going to look uh, in the next three months as much as possible. We're taking huge soundings amongst all those areas of industries, the experts, uh, and I'm also talking to obviously a, a number of lawyers, and I've asked Barney to assist as much as he can in this as well. But I'm very happy and open to any further suggestions and thoughts. Uh, we haven't got a lot of time, but in a sense, that's a good thing because it means we're not gonna spend our time <coughs> straying off into areas. We are there to try and give the government a starting point. Uh, and obviously in much more detail, the government can go through that with their ministries. I'm not in government, no plans to be in government. And so we will operate on the fringe of this and try and indicate to government where they should go. And that's gonna be the purpose of what we do. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Ian. And now I'm going to ask Adite Ligari, Adite, a very warm welcome to your job as Director of Politaire. You've been absolutely marvellous at it. And uh, you're a lawyer by background. Would you like to ask the first question? And thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon. Thank you for the wonderful introduction and thank you to the panel for, for such a stimulating talk. This is a question for Barney, if I may, please. Barney, um, if, you, if you had to advise Her Majesty's Government today, which piece of EU law would you uh, recommend abolishing first? And how would that help the UK economy? I would, um, it's interesting, I would start with Mifid 2. I'd add to that, you said one piece, but I'd add solvency too. Um, because, um, and I wouldn't abolish them, I would look, I would go back to what they were striving to achieve and work out which bits of them um, we, we should retain, but then I'd rewrite those bits. Um, and MIFID II, with its 1.7 million provisions, I think has been responsible for the introduction of a compliance industry in the financial services um, sector which is extremely expensive and some elements of which I don't think move the ball down the pitch in terms of um, protecting industry from systemic and idiosyncratic risk, i.e. individual firm risk. And, um, uh, uh, and so I think if we remove unnecessary processes and um, check the box in the American language or tick the box in ours, um, processes which, which effectively a mere verification of of um, very small points indeed without much, I think, overall scheme to the, to the, the exercise, I think it'd be very um, beneficial for us and, and for the industry. Thank you very much indeed, Barney. Um, would anybody else on the panel like to chip in on their choice for the first um, piece of deregulation? Okay, we'll pass. Now, 
people in the audience who are joining us, will you please um, put in your questions via the chat function, please? Um, Ruth, you had a point um, at 1.57 about where you'd start. Sorry, a point about what? I think you said you had a, an idea, well, you had a question for the panelists on stem cell research. Oh, I see. No, one of the, someone in the audience um, said, why did I think that the EU stifled innovation? Um, in the longer version of the speech I had before I had to cut it down, I spent a, a bit of time discussing um, gene editing and genetic modification. Now, this is complicated stuff, but in brief, I mean, this is a really rather good example. Um, most people involved in that sort of thing wanted um, freedom to proceed with gene editing plants without putting them through the same expensive and delaying regulation at genetically modified crops. We waited a couple of years for the European Court of Justice to give their opinion, and then the court rejected the advice about liberalization and ruled that gene edited organisms should be treated in the same way as genetic modified organisms. And the result I'm told is that organic farmers are free to use pesticides invented in the first half of the 20th century, but not the modern ones. And if you want another example, take vaccination right now. We have seen in, in, in the starkest way how uh, the European notion of, of solidarity and um, some timidity in, 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 in respect of these matters has led to our breaking free. I mean, it's one of the first examples of our getting ahead in innovation and Europe lagging behind. Thank you very much. Another question in from Martin Hall. I'm going to give you two questions, please. One from Martin Hall, is data protection a high priority area for review? It should be. And another question from uh, David Campbell Bannerman to panelists. Since we are talking about the UK economy, not just GB, what about Northern Ireland? Is more reform possible uh, if Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol is triggered, even if Northern Ireland only remains in the EU Customs Union for Goods, Agriculture and Industrial? And another question from David Collins, uh, who's an international economic lawyer, to what extent does the UK EU TCA allow the UK to diverge in its regulatory approach from the EU without facing consequences, for example, tariffs? So a cornucopia of questions there. Um, who would like to deal with Martin Howe's question, which is, what about data protection? Ian. Um can I just say that we, uh, the two areas that we will look at which flow through everything and we keep encountering will be the GDPR regulations, absolutely, uh, because uh, they have become unbelievably complex uh, and slow down the activities in almost every single economic area, uh, as well as in personal charities are bogged down by them in, and the cost level is very high. And the other area I think which we will definitely look very carefully at is IP, which hasn't been mentioned. Uh, because that is, again, an area that has become very complex and needs to be resolved and resolved fairly quickly. So these are areas that we will look at, certainly. Thank you. Lord could, I, could I just add two quick words? First of all, I completely agree the GDPR is over heavy, far too complicated, much more simply. Uh, secondly, I do think it also important to look at the economic value of data and to make certain that people who supply data get a reasonable re return on what they supply, and it isn't just a contributor to monopoly profits. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, anything on David Collins's question about UK EU, uh, to what extent does the TCA allow the UK to diverge in its regulatory approach without um, facing consequences? I'm happy to, to comment on that. I mean, the TCA doesn't cover uh, services or financial services. Um, it covers goods. Um, there are um, There is the ability to do whatever we want, um, but um, so long as we're prepared to um, accept tariffs on the resulting trade from, with the EU uh, to true up 
from their perspective, the um, any sort of um, uh, uh, competitiveness effects on the EU. But that is an international law test, which is where there's a high bar uh, to show that there's a material impact on, on EU trade. And just on Northern Ireland, to pick up on, on the other aspect of this, I mean, Northern Ireland, the, the, the protocol restricts this in respect of trade um, across the north-south border, in fact, east-west at the moment, but basically Northern Ireland operates under the EU regime and the EU state aid uh, regime for goods and agri-products. Um, I think that needs to be changed and that's a separate discussion and topic uh, because it does hold us back from some of the things we're wishing to do. And may I put, bring in a question from Alastair Truger to the panelists and one of the pieces of EU of law that is most under threat is the limited liability of platforms and marketplaces. Given the crit criticality of these laws for innovation, how will you balance this limited liability with popular desire for scapegoats? Thank you, Alistair. Uh, Barney, do you want to have a crack at that? Uh, well, I'm, I mean, you know, we do need to look at liabilities. I mean, that's one of the key elements of the common law approach. Uh, liabilities for adverse consequences caused by negligence and, and sort of, um, uh, actions in breach of one's rule book or contracts. Um, but the balance uh, may be wrong, wrong in this area and it does need to be looked at again. Uh, two more questions and then I'm afraid I'll have to close. Uh, one from Felix Schwendemann to panellists. How important is equivalence on financial services for the UK post-Brexit? And the other from Bruce Goodwin to panellists, but actually it's to Suella and Ian particularly. Um, would you agree that the government has to, quote, sell this process as a move towards more flexible and agile regulation as opposed to deregulation? Uh, Yes, please. Shall, shall I come in on the last one? Um, and then Ian may want to add something. Well, I think that, um, you know, the Brexit vote was a vote for more flexibility and agility um, in the broader sense of those words. And I think it would, the government would be just doing a disservice to the British people if it wasn't to um, look more closely at the aspects that Ian is working on and um, analysing and coming up with uh, opportunities to make that flexibility and agility a reality in our frameworks. So I'm, you, you use the word sell as a slightly kind of in a slightly cynical way. I, I, I think um, what's worked for this government uh, and what will work in uh, navigating the opportunities presented by Brexit uh, will be an honest um, uh, explanation and exposition of the opportunities <coughs> that are available in tangible terms to businesses, uh, various sectors and individuals. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to, a couple of quick comments following um, uh, Suella, uh, she's right about this. I want to just point out two things very importantly here. Number one, with regards to this, if we ask ourselves the question, what is the problem in the UK economically? It's not that we have low productivity, which is always touted at us, but London and the South East have the highest productivity in the whole of Europe. Our problem is the rest of the UK does not meet the average for the UK, which tells you the whole story about what's happened is we've become completely and utterly <clears throat> centralized in economic activity around London and the South East. So if we want to level up which is the agenda of the government quite rightly, then we have to look at ways of being more flexible and giving businesses and industries opportunities to start and to proceed in areas, new areas coming up and also in existing areas which have been so regulated uh, that they've either disappeared from the UK or in fact, they're just no longer conducted because it's too difficult. The second aspect I would say about this, which I have myself discovered endlessly, is that when I was Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, I discovered that I was actually responsible for health and safety. And uh, I wanted immediately to, uh, to change everything because that was the general view. When I went and had a look at it and talked to them about it, in fact, what we discovered was it wasn't actually so much to do with the regulations set around health and safety, because in fact, many of them are very vague. Uh, in other words, allowing people to, uh, to make their best judgment. And the example I came across, which you may find 
uh, peculiar, which is, exemplifies what I'm saying, is I remember one morning waking up to discover that Wimbledon had shut off their thing they called Murray Mound or, or whatever it was, that where all the fans sit and watch and celebrate because there'd been rain the night before and the slope was conceived to be slippery now and they were worried uh, that people might hurt themselves. I rang up the head of health and safety and I said, my goodness gracious, is this anything to do with you? And she said, absolutely not. There is nothing in the health and safety regulations to stop people sliding down hills and falling over and hurting themselves as they've been making that decision for thousands of years. And we think it's quite reasonable for them to make that decision and take the risk themselves. Whereupon she got on to Wimbledon who changed it. Turned out, of course, who was responsible for that? It was their insurance company. Their liability was in the insurance, over-interpreting again and again and again what in actual fact is the law and forcing companies and businesses to, uh, to stop doing things. And I think that's an area that we will have to look at if we want to level up and to get this economy moving is the over-interpretations of fal false consultants that spring up around this regulation. Thank you. Ruth, would you like to come in on any of the points? And I'll, I'll relay one from Lord Hope then. Um, I think the only area where I might come in is um, financial equivalence. Not that I know much about it, but the argument that Barney has been putting forward for years is that financial um, equivalence for financial services ought to be granted. It can only be a sort of protectionist attitude if it's not granted. Um, there are some who say that we should turn our eyes more towards New York and the Far East. But for the time being, I, I would um, go along with Barney on saying, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't have equivalence. Barney, do you want to pick up on this being your particular subject, enhanced equivalence? I, I agree with that. Um, the, the, the extra point I'd make is that um, all this stuff we're talking about, about the future of UK law and regulation, we should do anyway. There have been suggestions that we should wait and see what the EU might allow us to do and in the context of not just equivalence discussions, but all other trade discussions. And I think that would be a big mistake. I think we should do what's right for the UK and in this context for the financial services industry. Um, and then wait and see if the EU prepared to get uh, um, get off their uh, current stance of uh, saying, well, we won't give you equivalents unless you do what we like, and nevertheless grant us equivalents anyway. And that's, I think, the right way around. We have generally higher standards um, and fewer rules. That's our method of regulating. And that's what we should get back to. And it's more predictable and we'll do better from that. And then I believe the EU will give us equivalents in the end at some point anyway. Right, the final question please from David Lord Hope of Craighead to the panelists. A question for Barney picking up Lord Thomas's uh, phrase about the common law, we do borrow well. Do you favour keeping an eye on our common law countries, what they are doing in the regulatory field, what, what may be ahead of the field, but is there room for this? Um, yes, I think, uh, so, so the question from Lord Hope is exactly right. I think we should, uh, uh, well, I think what he's asking uh, is that we should look to other common law regimes and, and um, approaches. And in fact, I'd also include Scots law in that. And we always have things to learn from others. Um, and, and I think there's nothing to be lost in looking for the best ideas around the Welsh judges. Australian judges, for a start, have um, often led the way on, on various conceptual thinking in recent years. And I think uh, we benefit from uh, being able to adopt the bits of, of, of that sort of thinking that, as we identified as being um, uh, sound. Thank you very much, Barney. Would I'd like to ask each member of the panel, would you like to leave us with a final word and then starting uh, with Ruth and then moving on and ending with Suella, um, if you please, in reverse the order to speaking. Ruth? I think for the last 40 years, we have been inclined to forget, both in our universities and um, in our dealings, that there is a great common law world out there of which we were always part. Indeed, we, we gave that common law to them. And it's high time, as has just been said, to start looking at developments in Australia and New Zealand uh, and elsewhere to strengthen us and enhance us as we go forward, instead of looking to see 
what's going on um, in European law. And I look forward to um, this era of starting afresh, getting rid of the things that have irritated us so much, like uh, the general data protection rules. And I'm grateful to Barney for showing us light at the end of the tunnel. Ian, would you like a final word? Well, only that, um, uh, first of all, thank you very much indeed. It's been a really fascinating discussion. And um, uh, I think we're all generally agreed in the, in the general direction. I, the group that I'm looking at will take much of this conversation forward and the paper that Barney's written today uh, as a way of trying to populate our sense of direction and exemplify it. So anyone's got any interesting and decent ideas, uh, my door is open. Uh, thank you, Ian. And Barney? Uh, well, uh, I just, um, I hope everyone sees the opportunity now to rethink our approach uh, and, to, and to take advantage of our ability now to craft our regime, laws and regime, better for the UK. Uh, and I don't think we should um, hold back in doing that or look over our shoulder as to whether other people might approve of, of, of what we're doing. We should, we should seek to do things better for ourselves first and foremost, and that includes uh, the Scots law system as well as the uh, common law system. Uh, Lord Thomas. Thank you again very much for allowing me to participate in what's been a fascinating discussion. I think we should borrow, we should certainly look at agile countries like Singapore, which is a common law jurisdiction, without, I hope, creating this spectrum of we're creating a Singapore on Thames, but also have regard to the thinking that's going on in Europe and elsewhere. But I think the most important thing is we must look forward we must be bold, and I do stress that, uh, and be very confident in our own history and what we can achieve. Together, I think we can go forward <coughs> very well indeed. Thank you very much. And Suella, and thank you again. Thank you, Sheila, um, and well done, Barney, on a magnificent achievement. And as I said, which, um, uh, I'm sure it'll make a seminal contribution to the debate going forward. You know, the British people were brave and, as Lord Thomas said, bold in their instruction in 2016. They didn't flinch in the face of crisis, in the face of opposition, in the face of attempts to subvert the, uh, um, the, the work to deliver upon their instruction. And um, it's up to us now, policymakers, parliament, um, government, to embrace that boldness and replicate it in how we make the most of the opportunity ahead of us. I'm sure this is one uh, critical aspect in which that will be realized. Thank you very much, Suella. Well, it's a very great privilege and an honor to be here today to, to thank such a stellar panel. I'm extremely grateful to every one of them. I think what we've heard has, has reminded us that of the pragmatic nature of UK law, uh, throughout. And I think we started with Suella's opening on, on, on Lord Mansfield coming down from Scotland and thinking about uh, commercial law. And that's what we've been talking about today. It, it seems absolutely right that the UK should now be poised to take its leadership in the law, as Lord Thomas said, and uh, borrow where it need be, where it need do so. And I have no doubt that with such fine minds as we have on our panel, advising and thinking about the freedom which case law and judge-made law can bring, that in, in looking to the future and in working out where we go uh, with UK law, now that we are making our own law, uh, we the UK will do very well. Um, and if I may just say, it seems to me that today we've heard why it will do very well, because in UK law, there is something old, there is also something new and the opportunity to innovate. There is a great ability to borrow. And I think the blue will be the common law lead that they give the world over. So thank you all very much. And thanks to a marvelous group of guests joining us today. Uh, many, many guests and thank you all and congratulations, Barney.